Hello, this is Jitte Wagen and this is the third video in a series of videos in which I will be introducing QGIS 3.4 long-term stable release. In this video I will be dealing with a couple of subjects. Uh, first of all, I want to demonstrate how you can use uh, Access Microsoft Access Data in uh, QGIS. Uh, furthermore, I want to uh, deal with uh, joining data between layers. I then also want to show how to make uh, a simple distribution map. And I want to finish with some basic uh, data conversions and analysis in QGIS. Okay, so to start with the first uh, subject, um, dealing with databases. Now, um, the QGIS has a whole range of tools for dealing with databases and um, I will be I will I will showcase a little bit the different possibilities but I will mainly be focusing on how to work with a Microsoft Access database because that is the least straightforward database type to work with in QJS but on the other hand um, in archaeology at least in the Dutch context but also I think in the international uh, sector um, Microsoft Access databases are often used, if not still the most common database type for several reasons. Reasons that have to do with the portability of Microsoft Access, the fact that it's uh, almost standard uh, available on a lot of um, computers in, uh, in academia, um, the fact that it has a very good uh, system of working with forms and views, um, and I think it's in any case the database that is uh, the, the easiest accessible uh, for for many uh, archaeology um, uh, branches. So um, I think it's still very important to show how to deal with that type of database. However, before going to Microsoft Access databases, I will give a I will give you a quick taste of the way QGIS deals with databases, uh, and for this we will start with this um, option in the menu of QGIS, uh, which is the database manager. Now, if we look at the database manager, um, you can see that it allows us to access various types of databases. I won't go through all of them. But maybe um, a name that, that may ring a bell is, for example, PostGIS, which is a spatial extension of PostgreSQL, um, and uh, which is, of course, a uh, multi-user server-based uh, database that, uh, that is often uh, used. And uh, you can directly import data if, if you uh, provide QGIS with the right um, location of the data and all the uh, the registration information that you need to have. On the other hand, um, it also works with spatial light. Maybe spatial light uh, rings a bell. It is the spatial version of SQL light, which is maybe a bit more um, known. And um, you can also directly import uh, data from spatial light into QGIS. And the advantage of Spatial Light is that it is like Microsoft Access a portable database format. So it's actually a, a um, database uh, that you can copy from one location to another, place on the USB stick, send over uh, as an email um, attachment to someone else and you can directly open it, which is of course a bit different than how uh, something like um, PostgreSQL works. Now, it's also very easy to uh, create, for example, a specialized database using QGIS. You can see here in the uh, browser panel that these uh, database um, packages are also listed uh, in the sources of possible data. And if you would, for example, uh, select specialized, hit the right mouse button and click on create database, um, you are unable to uh, to create a special light database. So let's go to the right location on our our drive, and we can make a uh, 
an example database. And now we have a, a specialized database that we can directly access from, uh, from this um, menu or the, the browser panel. So we can also access this now through our database manager in which it is immediately um, made available. Um, and we can uh, create a table, for example. So now we can just start uh, creating uh, tables, adding fields, and um, having a database directly available in QJS to enter data to digitize in uh, as an alternative, for example, to digitize in into a shapefile. Okay, so that was very short on uh, how to uh, access uh, different types of databases through QGIS. I will now turn to uh, uh, connecting to a uh, Microsoft Access database. And in order to do that, we have to uh, start with Windows. Because what we need to do is we have to configure the open database protocol um, to uh, connect with a database located on our hard drive, um, which is a protocol that QGIS on its turn can then use to access that specific database. So we have to first configure in Windows and then make sure we create and establish uh, this connection from QGIS to the, uh, the Open Database uh, protocol. Okay, so the fastest way to, uh, to access this uh, this data protocol, we go to start, um, or rather search, and we enter open database connectivity, um, and we select the, uh, the correct uh, bits version for our computer. Okay, here we can uh, select add, and we will be able to add a, a driver for a, uh, a data source um, and you can see that we can now uh, add various uh, Microsoft products here. Uh, we, we want to add a Microsoft Access database, so a .mdb or .accdb <coughs> and we, uh, we select the driver for that and we click on finish. Now we can give it a name and the name here is important to remember because this is the name we will have to uh, also configure in QGIS so he looks for the right um, object and of course we have to select the database that this name refers to so select and we have to go to the uh, drive and to the folder in which we store our database and there it is so I now just uh, Hit OK, again, and there it is, Nijmegen, and I hit OK again. <coughs> okay, and then from within QGIS, we can now simply go to Add Factor Layer. Here we can uh, set a source type, so instead of file, we will set database. The type, indeed, uh, has to be ODBC. And we will add a new connection. So we click on new. Here again we set the type to ODBC. We can give it a name. Now um, let's uh, say name eigen database. I need to set the host which will be the local host because we are um, referring to uh, the database protocol on this computer and we want the database name. So this is the actual name that we just uh, configured in the um, uh, the open database connection administration window in the windows okay the port is fine we do not want to set any authentication and we test the connection which is successful so we hit ok and we uh, we hit add okay and of course, we didn't need a password because I didn't set any authentication.
Okay, so now we have direct access to uh, to all layers in this uh, database, and we can uh, select one or multiple layers now to directly add to our GIS project. Um, for this demonstration, I created a data um, a table which here has been attributed layer ID one, which is called um, trench thirty one. Put N in there. Uh, Sporen, so Trench 31 features, um, and I will add only this table. So I hit OK, and I can close this window. OK, so as you may notice, um, indeed, there has been added now a table. So we have also now suddenly a new icon. So we don't have any factor or raster indication, but you can see here indeed the sign of a table and uh, ODBC uh, with uh, Nijmegen put uh, in their spore. So what now happened is that this data has been added as a table. So this data does not have any spatial definitions or geometry in it. So um, there's nothing to visualize. And so there's also nothing to turn off or on because this is a simple table with data in it. Now we can of course look at it by opening it, opening the attribute table, and this is directly um, the data as uh, as it is in the database. Now there's one important thing to uh, to say about this data. What we now have is data which is directly imported um, from the Microsoft Microsoft Access database, and it's also still linked. So. Um, what I can't do at this moment is now turn on an editing mode because the the, the connection through the uh, through the protocol does not allow that we use GIS QGIS to edit um, information directly in the Microsoft Access database. So this is a bit different than if you would work with Spatial Light database, you could change immediately all the data and it would be updated with uh, with the data source uh, when it when we work with a Microsoft Access database this is not the case okay so what I now want to do is I want to connect uh, the data from um, this table to my shapefile containing the uh, spatial definitions of the features in trench 31 um, I will make it a little bit easy now, so I will make uh, um, a sub-selection of my um, my features file uh, to only contain uh, all the features from French 31. And so, in order to do this, I will start a by now familiar procedure. So I will uh, open the uh, select by expression in the attribute table, go to fields and values, select trench equals um, 31 um, and I select features now I will go to show only selected features to see if my query works um, and it did so now now I only have my selected features and I will just zoom to selection um, to uh, have this uh, Confirmed, and I will turn off all the other data so it's a little bit uh, easier to see. And this is indeed trench 31. Um, and then I will uh, save this to a different file. So I will go for the right click on the layer, exports, and save selected features as. Now I will uh, just save this with the simple name of trench underscore 31. Save. Okay, and there it is. Okay, so in order to uh, connect these two um, data files, I need to make sure that there is a corresponding and unique ID in both of them. Now, for the uh, shape file, this would be uh, the data in this field, um, which is uh, the feature number. So we have one, for um, them, one to nine. Uh, 999 and here three uh, entries into the 5000 and I will look into the attribute table of my ported access database file 
and I can see that um, that this contains um, the same numbers. So we see here that we have um, one to nine, nine hundred to ninety-nine, and then some numbers in the five thousand. So there are a bit more numbers in the five thousands here than are in my shape file. But at this moment, I uh, I do not really care about that. This may have something to do with negative uh, archaeological features, uh, which is something that only makes sense if you know um, uh, archaeological stratigraphy, but in any case, uh, there may be also just errors. I don't know. Um, this is not my data file, but as I said, uh, at this moment, it's not really important. What is important, though, is that you need to connect this data um, and then the uh, IDs connecting the data uh, need to be exactly the same and also of the same data type. And here you see maybe already a potential problem in the sense that in the uh, attribute table of the shapefile, we see here the numbers lined out to the right of the field, which means that this is a numeric data type. And we could also... Um, find this out in another way if we would want to know specifically to go to the properties and look for the fields in this uh, this table um, <clears throat> and here we could see that indeed we have here a uh, a long long integer 64 field uh, of 10 um, characters length or numbers length I should say and so this is um, this is a num numeric field. Now, if we look closely at the uh, table, uh, I have a couple of them open. I see. If we look closely to the um, table from the database, we can see that we have here a different configuration because we see here that they are outlined to the left, uh, which means that they are actually text stored as text. Uh, uh, entries and that there are leading zeros so we have leading zeros here and of course it's only possible if you use text because if you would enter 0001 in a numeric field the three zeros would simply uh, be ignored um, so this data in this shape will not uh, connect properly okay so in order to make it connect properly we need to uh, change a field or add a field in either one of these tables to uh, to change this situation and um, in this case I will be uh, going for uh, a change in the shape file now why do I choose for change in the shape file um, I may want to repeat this process and if I repeat the process which I mean I import data from the Microsoft Access database, I will again get my feature numbers with these leading zeros. So uh, if I do not want to change every time I import this Microsoft database table, which may be updated because the, the data processing um, from the finance administration is still, uh, still going on, for example, um, it is better if I uh, make sure that the shape file is changed because that is a rather static file, at least in terms of uh, numbering, and I only have to make the change once. Once, so that's a very simple reason um, to choose uh, for changing the shape file. So let's do that. Now again, um, I have been uh, going through this before, but we can uh, enter an editing session for this. Uh, this attribute table connected to the shape file. Um, I can add a new field, but if I use the open field, the field calculator, I can also directly create a new field. So let's do that. So I have now here uh, create new field. Um, I want uh, that field to have a name. So I will say that this is my. Um, connection field okay so there's a maximum number of characters here so i'll just leave it as for an underscore con um i do not want a number field i want a text field because i need to add the leading zeros here to be able to link to the file 
and then I will uh, leave the rest as it is and I will write a an expression that will actually give me um, the the numbers from my column spawn so I want the numbers from the column which is actually called number which refers to the feature number but I want to make sure that I uh, add these leading zeros now of course there is a function that does that and here uh, Google is of course your best friend uh, and I need to uh, set this uh, function properly so zeros are being being added to a maximum of four uh, numbers in this uh, in, in this entry okay so the expression that we need here is left padding um, open and close um, I then need to add the field name in which uh, that I want to use um, the data from I then have to set how to how many characters do I want to fill up the information from that field uh, which will be uh, transported to a new field of course and then I need to uh, to add what character do I want there and because this is a text field we are now talking about uh, numbers as characters <coughs> and I will uh, I will say that I want uh, a zero added for every empty spot when the information from the field number is being left padded up to four characters so this is what I want and I will hit OK you can also see an output preview from a random record in the uh, attribute table so you can see here directly that this is indeed going to give us the result that we want and if I hit OK then we'll we have our field so we have here spawn underscore con and we have our left padded um, leading zero fields that are now actually uh, exactly similar as the fields in the database table and so I can now finally establish this, uh, this link okay so now in, to or in order to establish this link we go to the uh, properties of the layer we want to uh, link with, uh, with the database table so I go to Trench 31, right-click properties. I have here a tab which is called Joins, which is the name in, uh, in GIS for uh, connecting uh, data. I will uh, then uh, click on the, on the plus sign, add a new, uh, new join. Here I can select every data that actually, every uh, layer that has actually data that we can join in this way. This is vector join so I'm only um, presented vector layers and database layers now I will of course connect the ODBC database table we have to set a join field now it's going to be spore so the feature number then we have a target field which is going to be from the, uh, the, the, the shape file itself so that's going to be the field we just created um, and we uh, we want to set which fields we join now and in this case I am specifically interested in the uh, feature interpretation and maybe I want to know a bit more whether there have been any specific um, comments about the fields and I think a begin date, end date, begin period, and end period may be uh, interesting to, uh, to add to the, uh, connect to the connected field. So I hit OK. Now I have here my uh, joint, um, joint database table. I will click OK. And if everything went as it should, I will now have my data from the Microsoft Access Database imported table connected to my shape, uh, shape files attribute table and indeed we have it so we have here our data from uh, from the attribute table of the shape file up to here and then from that point onwards you can see here the ODDC connected records and now we have here the interpretation we have here the dates and periods and we have here the comments which are none 
but we have our connected data and this we can again demonstrate this by identifying one of the features in our layer and then you can see that indeed we have now all the information directly connected uh, this is apparently a ditch uh, with a very specific date in uh, in the uh, in the in the bronze age so um, yeah this is uh, this is how you establish such a connection between layers and in this case uh, specifically with a, a imported Microsoft Access database table okay so now that I showed you how to uh, connect to a Microsoft Access database I want to finish with that with this uh, session on uh, external databases and in the second part of the screencast I want to I want to start with uh, showing yet again uh, how you can um, import data from an external data portal and in this case I will select the data portal of the uh, National Heritage Agency the Rijksdienst voor Cultureel Erfgoed uh, that actually has a database of all archaeological monuments, uh, excavations and uh, events and this is of course for the Dutch uh, sector very relevant to be able to do this but there are many of these types of portals in other countries as well of course so this is also a demonstration of how to do it um, and getting factor data from uh, from external, uh, external source now in order to access this uh, data from uh, from the national heritage agency uh, which is called uh, you have to access a system that's called argis and i will go to that system by just entering argis 3 because it's version 3 and there i go to uh, indeed the first link so argis reacties for cultural airfoil inloggen and here i uh, i get to the login page where you can access various uh, services of the uh, of, uh, of Argis 3. Now, I um, th there are many different things that you can do, and it also depends on the type of, of access that you have to this data. Because um, archaeological companies will have different um, types of access um, than, for example, just a, a, an interested uh, citizen. Um, I will. Uh, use my simple search and find uh, account to get into the system and get some data that's actually that may actually be relevant for the data we are examining uh, of the excavations uh, in Nijmegen so I will go to open zoek and find and search and find now I have a uh, a uh, registration already which uh, you can get by contacting the uh, National Heritage Agency and I'll hit OK and here we get into the uh, the system with which we can actually look for uh, for well we can search through all the all the uh, archaeological information that's stored here um, in order to uh, make this a bit easier i'll go to the uh, map and i will zoom to the area we are currently working in which must be more or less here okay so let's suppose <coughs> I want all the archaeological information stored in this online system that surrounds the field where the excavations took place so I can use here a select tool and in fact this is an online GIS a web GIS uh, so it uh, performs similar to what we uh, what we see in QGIS uh, we select these features, these are vector features, so everything the selections will intersect is being now selected. If I then go to uh, this tab over here, archaeological or archaeological events, I can see that indeed I have a set of results that corresponds to the selected features on the map, and this is of course analogous to what we've seen so far in QGS, it's a uh, map elements are directly connected to uh, to the database and the selection in one is the selection in the other 
Now I want to uh, use these 39 um, results because it's interesting, uh, possibly interesting archaeological excavation uh, um, information that I would want to be able to compare with my uh, my excavation data. So I will hit for that download and then choose for GeoJSON and download the data. I will save the file. I will. Uh, Retrieve it from the download section and then we can go back to QGIS um, after I store it, of course, in the uh, data set the, uh, that we have already uh, working with. So I will save it here and go back to QGIS. Okay, so in QGIS, then um, I can enter this data by adding a vector layer. We'll uh, set it back to the file, select the data set, so I have to hit that button. And then there's another uh, feature in uh, QGIS which is um, quite useful. Um, you can, if you look for a file, um, look for every file. So here you see all files with the, um, with the asterisk. But if you want to only look for specific files, and it can of course be very useful if you have uh, folders uh, with a, a very large number of files which are not all of the same type then you can set here a type and it will only show you the um, file types um, for which you are filtering now so if I select here GeoJSON we can actually see here the GeoJSON file that we uh, entered into this um, uh, into this folder that we copied into this folder and of course, <clears throat> if you are not finding a, a file that of which you are sure that it should be here, it is very wise to uh, to double check if you are not uh, only set to uh, recognize a specific uh, file type. So I, now I will just open this, add, and then close. And now we see that we have here RCE all added to our. Uh, our project. Now we are very zoomed in on um, on our trench 31 so I will right click zoom to layer zoom out a bit in order to see the rest of uh, the uh, or in order to see the information at all. I will uh, turn on the complete excavation and I will turn on the uh, aerial photograph for a bit more contextualization and if we now uh, zoom in on the terrain we can see that there are indeed um, some archaeological events connected to the terrain and we can now of course also access the information that we downloaded from the web portal to uh, to see what this amounts to and here we can see that this is indeed a, um, a registration of uh, an archaeological find um, and it's something, it's a uh, pre, uh, prehistorical pottery that has been found there. And it may very well be that the, um, the uh, identification or the sporadic finds uh, reported by, by people who uh, came across these finds um, were actually the reason why uh, this, uh, this sampling uh, uh, layout of, uh, of trial trenches was actually uh, dug here to see uh, if there was maybe a uh, an important prehistoric settlement to excavate. So there it is, uh, the online ar uh, archives data directly uh, into your QGIS for you to uh, analyze in connection with the uh, excavation results. Okay, now in the last phase of this um, video, I want to show how you can uh, do some very basic um, analysis in QGIS by using the geoprocessing tools. Now, in order to do that, um, I'm going to turn to a bit of an artificial scenario because um, I do not really have very interesting uh, uh, data to do. Uh, basic analysis use geoprocessing tools so we're going to um, work with an artificial uh, scenario in which 
we are going to assume that these um, individual finds that we added to the uh, to the projects from the file earlier that we are interested to see whether there is some um, clustering in them so um, of course these, these finds come from trenches so in any case there is a, a spatial patterning in them through the constraints of the of the trenches um, but we'll ignore that for now we'll just take these as finds that have been uh, attested in this area re all related to uh, to the prehistoric period and we want to find out whether there is some kind of clustering um, that may be of some significance to uh, let's say the intensity of human activity in a specific subpart of this this area now and then again um, to do spatial clustering analysis, there are uh, of course good tools for that. Um, QGS is also able to perform spatial statistical analysis, but in this case, we will go for a very simple vi um, visualization analysis. Now, what I want to do in order to uh, to perform this analysis, um, I'm interested in potential. In, in what happens if I create buffers around these fields, uh, around these finds, so we can see where um, the buffers give us a visual uh, idea of finds that are closer or less close to each other, and maybe form some kind of clusters. Okay, now in order to do this, I will go to the uh, factor menu option, uh, select geoprocessing tools, and then I will select buffer. Now, what this buffer is going to do, it's going to uh, place an imaginary uh, uh, rod at the center of, uh, of this find. I, I can set the distance of this, uh, this uh, rod, and let's say I want it to be 40 meters long, and it will then draw a perfect circle around the point. Now, of course, I need to uh, select the correct um, Layer, so I want this to do this with the uh, finds that I added earlier. Um, and I think the most important thing here to mention is that uh, I want to create a temporary layer. Now, this is very convenient that QGS um, offers the option of uh, creating a temporary layer. So instead of uh, saving the result of this uh, analysis uh, directly to your hard disk, it just creates uh, a file in the RAM of your uh, computer and it will add it to the uh, layers panel and you are done, then able to, uh, to inspect the results uh, and if the, the results are not what you want them to be you can just remove the uh, temporary layer from your uh, layers panel but you are not going to have to remove anything from your hard disk so that's very convenient that you can let's say, work a little bit quicker without creating a, a whole mess uh, of files on your hard disk that you may forget to delete or whatever. So we'll do that. Um, and as I said, I set it to 40 meters and let's see what we, uh, what we have. Close. And indeed we can see that if this uh, 40 meters would be uh, a meaningf meaningful distance uh, somehow, it is indeed creating um, find buffers that are actually overlapping um, and there are also some um, some distances between uh, various uh, overlapping um, overlapping uh, concentrations of overlapping buffers okay now i want to visualize this a little bit better so what i want to do actually is to um, create an outline of these overlapping polygons uh, so that they are forming one polygon per um, imaginary cluster um, and then we can also uh, attribute different colors to these, uh, to these different clusters. Now in order to do this uh, I need to uh, use a geoprocessing option which is called Dissolve. And Dissolve means that we are actually going to merge all these features and for those who pay attention paid attention you could have seen that in uh, the geoprocessing buffer tools there was already the option to dissolve the results but there's also of course the uh, 
the GeoProcess tool uh, separately, and we are going to use that uh, that now. Okay, so for the uh, the dissolve action, we are indeed going to uh, take this buffered layer. So you can see here that this temporary uh, layer has been uh, created, and here you can see this little sign means that it is only there in your um, your running memory and not on your hard disk. Um, and well, we don't have to set any specific uh, options here. You can. Um, you can set some fields on which you want to specifically resolve, but we don't want that everything to resolve. And we, of course, want to create um, a temporary layer and open output file after running the algorithm. Okay, so if we then look at the result, we can now see that we indeed created um, different um, polygons, but also what you may immediately notice is that if I select one of them, they are actually all selected. Now, what? Why is this? It is because this dissolved action is actually not making any uh, any separation. It it literally dissolves all the geometrical features in the layer. Um, so it doesn't really care whether these are uh, overlapping or intersecting um, intersecting features. And what it does, it creates a so-called multi-part polygon. So this is now one polygon with one entry in the uh, attribute table, which you can see here. Um, and um, what we would actually want, of course, is an individual polygon for every each of the, the, the these five clusters that uh, we identified here through buffering analysis. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, for that, we need a tool which is called, um, let's see, Geometry Tools Multi Parts to Single Parts. And again, the process is, is very simple. Uh, we select the soft result uh, that we created with the dissolved action. Again, we are happy with the temporary layer and we want the out output file. So let's run it. Let's close it. And now we can indeed see individual clusters. We have a uh, an attribute table with uh, indeed um, in five individual records. Uh, and that's exactly what we uh, what we want. Okay, <clears throat> so now we uh, we can throw out at least these two temporary layers. So we can just remove those. There you are. And what we now have, we have of course a visual hierarchy between these uh, five clusters. Although these two uh, may be. Um, more or less of the same area um, and we may now want to actually show which one is the is the largest and we can do that by uh, calculating their, uh, their respective area we can also do that by uh, by showing how many on how many finds these buffers are actually created and then of course the final uh, and most um, the, the normalized value to uh, to demonstrate that width would be a density of, of finds in every cluster. So we can now, in three subsequent steps, uh, visualize the relative densities. So first of all, we would be interested in uh, in calculating the respective areas. So for that, we go to uh, single parts, open the attribute table, and we want to go here for the field calculator. Create a new field, and we want to uh, to go for the we want to um, go for the geometry. And in the geometry, we want to uh, have the area calculated. So this is a preset um, function that you can just select, and then uh, it will uh, it will run. So let's do that. 
and now we have here indeed um, a number that indicates the area and the area is of course expressed in square meters so now I have the uh, the calculated area but I also want to calculate now the number of fines that are actually within the area to be able to count uh, or to uh, visualize the density because of course we may have a, a small polygon but if there are uh, twice as many fines in the polygon it still may be depending uh, on many factors of course um, that there would be uh, uh, much more uh, indication for uh, and, and, and more intense uh, human activity in the past. So let's go and do that. And there's a tool for that. We go to the factor analysis tools, count points in polygon. The polygons for which we want to count the number of fines that fall within it are single parts. Indeed, also the fines are already selected, which is good. They, the number of fines will be uh, tabulated in a some points which is fine as well and a temporary layer so to run this close so we will have a look at the uh, new count layer and see if indeed in the attribute table we now have counts and we do okay we can already see that this is an um, an interest interesting uh, result because uh if we sort the uh the records from uh, small to large based on the number of points in it we get uh, a different sorting than with, when we do that with uh, based on area so the, the second to the largest um, polygon here actually has 10 more fines in it so this is going to show in uh, in the density okay so let's create density so the actually the, the count of fines normalized for area now we can do this with a very familiar tool um, we want to create a new field, we will call it density and now we have to uh, be a little bit uh, careful here because we are going of course if we are going to uh, calculate the density of fines we will uh, calculate uh, very small numbers because in the end uh, the, uh, the proportion of fines to square meters is of course extreme and there are very few fines for the number of square meters so we have to make sure that we enable decimals because otherwise uh, we are not going to uh, be much and we'll just have zeros uh, as densities so the all number integer is not going to do it for us so we are going to go for the decimal number double now and then uh, the actual calculation is very simple and, uh, the number of points divided by the number of square meters click ok and now we see that we have here uh, very small scores but for the um for expressing relative proportions this this re really doesn't matter of course so we can now close the table and make the final visualization okay so we uh just to show i can stop the editing session of my count I will throw out single parts as well and now it is also time to make this because this is a result that we want to work with and we are happy with and um, so we will save this as an actual file on the hard disk so it's uh, save features as to so keep my uh, as a shape file file format I will call this um, uh, polygon density I'll save it now I can also throw out the temporary file accounts now I can go into the properties of the polygon go to symbology select a different symbol and of course now select uh, for example graduated because we have numeric values that we want to base visualization on we select density and classify and let's say we are happy with this visualization we hit ok and then we can indeed see that based on the density we have now there are two relatively small clusters a bit bigger but actually the, the, the largest one uh, number of square meters 
it's actually not the most dense one. Um, so yeah, as I, as I said from the beginning, this is a very artificial example um, fabricated by uh, when it comes to the archaeology, but it's just to show uh, how you can build up your basic steps in the analysis. Of course, I only used a few options, but there is an enormous amount of uh, analytical tools available in, uh, in QGIS, so uh, I would suggest go and find out what you can do. Now, with this final uh, set of steps, um, I've come to the end of the screencast in which I have shown how to uh, deal with uh, with the Microsoft Access database in QGIS and, and giving you some sneak peeks of how to work with uh, the other types of databases. I've shown how to uh, access uh, an online web portal, download vector data in a GeoJSON uh, format and add it to your GIS. And finally, I've shown you a series of steps uh, which are useful for uh, basic geoprocessing actions and uh, analysis. And so we've come to the end of this screencast. Um, thank you for watching and listening.